we're going to be talking about tonight is what's new in glaucoma surgery. And, you know, glaucoma is really kind of the underdog of surgical treatment. We all hear about cataract surgery and femtosecond, and even with retinal surgery, epiretinal membrane peeling, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that's really sexy and exciting, but glaucoma doesn't really generate that kind of buzz, that kind of excitement. And tonight, I'm going to introduce you to some things that I think are actually pretty exciting. Now, had you told me five years ago that glaucoma was exciting, I, I would have said you needed Lexapro or something. Uh, just briefly, this, uh, this information here, uh, everyone here, I believe, knows me, David Richardson. Now, the patient-focused ophthalmologist, that's not just kind of a tagline. Um, most of you are aware that a couple of years ago, I actually completely turned my practice upside down. And the reason I did that was because I found that when I was in the exam room, I could no longer be focused on my patients. I was too busy thinking about what kind of code am I going to use or, you know, what kind of documentation check marks do I need? Did I meet all the criteria for the exam? And I just, it was too distracting for me. And I'm a little OCD and that was just not good for me. So I've actually, as many of you know, changed my practice so that patients who come and see me, it, it's just between me and the patient. So I'm not involved with any insurances or even Medicare. And so when I'm in the room with the patient, I can truly be focused on, on the patient. And I found it, at least for me, um, again with my own kind of neuroses, to be a very freeing um, experience. And I hope that those of us who share patients, that your patients also uh, tell you that that's the experience they've had. But it's truly, if you ever get the chance to have that experience, whether it's through volunteering or something else, it's, it's something that, um, it's just, uh, it's an epiphany to have. So anyway, a little bit about my background. Many of you know me already, personally and professionally. I grew up here in Southern California in uh, Santa Paula, a little town of 20,000. And uh, my father was a self-proclaimed ditch digger for one of the uh, local utility companies. And I'm very, very fortunate. He was so dedicated and so supportive and you know really it's it's my mother pushed me academically and they saved and they scrimped and enabled me to get an outstanding education and I consider myself to be one of the products of you know the American dream right uh, two generations from abject poverty and so every chance that I get to give back I, I try to do so and and I hope that, and those of you, again, who you know, do regularly uh, share patients with me, you know, my practice is not a concierge practice where I only treat the wealthy of San Marino. My office may be in San Marino, but I very much enjoy uh, keeping my fees at a level where people such as my parents could afford to come and see me, all right? And, uh, and I do, on a you know, patient by patient basis, see people at no charge. And so if you ever have somebody who feel, you know, they really, you really want them to see me, don't hesitate to give me a call, speak to me on the phone, and, um, you know, I enjoy what I do. So. so let's get to the talk, glaucoma surgery. Now, it used to be there are only a couple of glaucoma surgeries to think about, so we could handle this whole talk in 15 minutes. We didn't have to parse things into categories. But now we're going to actually talk about a number of different types of surgeries and techniques. And I find it helpful just personally to, to categorize things. It helps me think about what surgery fits for what type of patient. And so we can split glaucoma surgery into roughly three categories using this categorical uh, uh, criteria. One is non-invasive, so a laser would be non-invasive. Minimally invasive, well this is really a whole new type of glaucoma surgery uh, that we'll be talking about in more detail. And then 
the penetrating or the, the standard glaucoma surgery, what we think of as trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. Okay. Now, clearly, of those three, most people would prefer to avoid that last one. So we can also think of glaucoma surgeries in terms of uh, a mnemonic uh, that I use, C. Shunts, which is essentially creating a non-physiologic pathway from the anterior chamber into usually a subconjunctival space, but it could be something else too. Enhance, which is to take the natural pathway of uh, anterior chamber through the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal and then out the collector channel system into the venous system. That would be enhance. And then the final one is ablate, destroy. All right. Now, what are the currently available surgical treatments here in the U.S.? And, um, you know, kind of like with cataract surgery where you talk about the currently available lenses and you have a small little list, uh, and then you compare that to what's available in Europe and you get a list that goes on and on and on for pages and pages and pages. The same kind of thing is true with glaucoma surgery. We have a pretty limited list of what we have available here in the U.S. And, um, you know, that's because the FDA is really restrictive. They do have a job of protecting us and our patients. There's a lot of uh, controversy uh, whether or not they're a little overly protective here in the US because there are a number of things the Europeans have access to that seem to be quite safe and effective that we don't have and probably won't have for years, and we'll get to those. So what are the currently available surgical treatments? In terms of the non-invasive, the ones that enhance the outflow, we have laser trabeculoplasty. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then we've got penetrating, which is we've had since I was born. 1968, trabeculectomy was uh, developed. Glaucoma drainage devices were developed around the same time. Lately, just in the last few years, this is really over the last maybe five to seven years, we've gotten a new class of glaucoma surgeries, which we call the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, which include cyclophotocoagulation, which is ablating the ciliary body, trabectome, which is ablating the trabecular meshwork, eye stent, which we'll argue whether it enhances anything, but in theory it enhances the outflow through the Schlem's canal, and then canaloplasty, which is there to enhance the natural drainage uh, flow from the anterior cha chamber into the canal out through the collector channel system. So why don't we start with, and again, well, I've, I've got these up here just to help us mentally categorize these things. So in terms of the non-invasive enhancing procedures, laser trabeculoplasty. Now, Argon laser trabeculoplasty has been around for a few decades. The lasers have been available clinically for uh, use since the 1970s. And argon laser trabeculoplasty really is, has kind of a, a neat history. It's one of those of many medical advances that were really kind of stumbled upon. Okay? So when lasers first came out, everybody thought they were really cool because they made holes. right? made a hole in anything you wanted to make a hole in. And they made holes when you bounced them off a mirror in the trabecular meshwork. Well, geez, isn't this obvious? Make a bunch of little holes in the trabecular meshwork, get flow into the canal, out the collector channel system, we're good to go. So they tried that in monkeys. And sure enough, they made holes. But then what happens in the eye as well as anywhere else when you make a, you know, a hole or an incision where it shouldn't be? scarred down, closed up. So, so then they said, well, okay, well, the holes aren't working. But you know what? If we laser these monkeys' trabecular meshwork, not quite enough to make a hole, just enough to coagulate it, to melt it a bit, it actually results in the pressure going up. So now we've got a monkey model of glaucoma. How great is that? Well, now we can induce glaucoma in monkeys, and now we can study other treatments on these monkeys. So they, they took a failure and they created a laboratory success. Except <laughs> that the monkey, this is one of those and then stories, it just keeps going. 
except it turns out that some of these monkeys who had enough laser therapy to coagulate but not enough to penetrate actually ended up with their pressures going down after the initial post-operative inflammatory response. So some bright scholar, scientist, researcher said, well, wait a second. Pressure went down. Something's going on. This could actually be a treatment for glaucoma. So they titrated it down a little bit more. Not quite enough to you know, make a big coagulative mess, but enough to make some structural change. And lo and behold, ALT, argon laser trabeculoplasty, was discovered. It was really stumbled upon. And to this date, we really don't know how it works. There's all these theories about, oh, it stretches the trabecular meshwork in between the spots, or it actually creates microscopic openings or tears. Nobody really knows. Um, it works well for open angle glaucoma. It can be performed in one to two sessions. Uh, but the problem is, is it does still result in microscopic scars. And, um, also may limit future surgeries, right? So surgeries that involve opening up that Schlimm's canal, it can actually be problematic because now you've got these scars that are, that are essentially sealing the canal. So surgeries such as canaloplasty and potentially some of the newer surgeries that are not yet available could be limited by argon laser trabeculoplasty. So more recently, in the 1990s, Dr. Latina um, developed selective laser trabeculoplasty. Now, it's called selective laser trabeculoplasty because the laser is selectively absorbed by pigment, so the melanin granules in the trabecular meshwork. And the neat thing about it is that it only uses 1% of the energy of argon laser trabeculoplasty and does not cause coagulative damage. So because it doesn't cause any coagulative damage, it doesn't limit future surgeries, it doesn't cause any kind of uh, PAS, and we've all seen aggressive peripheral anterior sneaky, I call them sawtooth, PAS. When somebody's had uh, aggressive ALT in the past, you look under gonio and you can see these little saw teeth. You won't see that with selective laser trabeculoplasty. Um, and because it doesn't cause any damage, it can actually be repeated. So it works about 70% of the time, works about as well as a drop, which is also about as well as argon laser trabeculoplasty works. So it's not really any better in terms of how effective it is, but it's, um, it's repeatable and it doesn't close future doors. So. Selective laser trabeculoplasty, when it first came out, was crazy expensive. It was, for one la it was a one-trick pony laser, so not too many people are going to be buying it. Not too many people did. Uh, so some companies developed uh, another technology called Micropulse Laser te uh, te Technology, or MLT, Micropulse Laser Trabeculoplasty. And this essentially um, segments the pulses into these tiny little super fast pulses. And by doing so, you don't get the, the heat, you don't get the, uh, the, the increase in temperature, so you don't get coagulative damage. And there's less damage in scarring, but you get the same kind of result as you would with SLT or argon laser trabeculoplasty, at least according to the company documents. There's not, there just aren't as many good studies on this. Uh, this probably would have some, been something that, that would have taken over and uh, we would have seen a lot more of that, except that now the SLT patent has just expired and so companies are now coming out with SLTs that are significantly less expensive than $70,000. So this, this may go by the wayside, this MLT. So now moving to really what is the mainstay of glaucoma surgery here in the U.S. And, and I want to go through all of the kind of the basics of where we are before we get into the new stuff because this is really going to set up uh, the stage for why the newer glaucoma surgeries are so interesting and are, are really exciting. Right? So trabeculectomy, 
is traditionally where, what we offer to patients who have failed drops, failed SLT, they're advancing their glaucoma, um, and traditionally their glaucoma has to be pretty, pretty severe, at least moderate to severe. You wouldn't offer trabeculectomy to somebody with mild glaucoma or just ocular hypertension. And why? Well, because what you're doing is, there's no other way to say it, it's pretty barbaric. You're creating a fistula in the eye. Now, I've got general surgery colleagues of mine, and they just think that we're crazy in ophthalmology. Like, you know, the whole rest of medicine tries to close fistulas when they appear spontaneously in the body. You, know, you guys, what are you doing? You're creating fistulas and trying to keep them open. And indeed, that's what we're trying to do. But you have to recognize historically that, that trabeculectomy was actually a, a step forward from what was done before trabeculectomy. Before 1968, penetrating procedures were full thickness procedures. You basically poked a hole in the eye and you let the fluid drain underneath the conjunctiva, which resulted in, not surprisingly, uh, somebody going from a pressure that was too high to too low. And then it scarred down and they went right back up where they were. <laughs> so the procedures weren't very effective. Now, as with argon laser trabeculoplasty, trabeculectomy was an accidental discovery. So Dr. Carnes, back in 1968, developed a procedure, um, the intent of which was to open up a, a flow from the anterior chamber through a trabeculectomy, so truly just a, a removing a portion of the trabeculum into the canal and out the drainage system. He wanted to reestablish physiologic drainage. But what happened in his, uh, in his paper that he published was that the patients who failed, and his definition of failure was a bleb was created. Because if a bleb was created, clearly the flow was not physiologic flow. Well, oddly enough, those patients who developed a bleb, a cyst on the surface of the eye, were the ones whose pressures dr dropped and successfully had treated glaucoma. So what was revolutionary at the time was, was really this right here, the flap, what was ca called a guarded flow. So instead of just being a hole in the eye, this flap that was created in the sclera and then laid back down allowed some restriction of flow, which had not been done before. So ironically, a surgical failure became the mainstay of glaucoma surgery for the world for the next 50 years. Right? But there are problems with trabeculectomy, and we all know what they are. Right? Trabeculectomy is hard to control. You can put this flap down, but it's all done by hand. And the, and the restriction of flow is, is all, you know, guesstimated. So you can end up with pressures that are too high, too low. If the pressures are too low, uh, you can end up with hypotony maculopathy. So a potentially permanent loss of vision from pressures being too low. How's that for a trade-off? Um, the success of trabeculectomy is entirely dependent upon the bleb. If you don't have a bleb, you fail. So of course, that meant that we had to develop all of these methods of keeping the body from doing what it naturally wants to do, which is heal itself. So what do we do? We throw poisons, what we call anti-metabolites, because poison doesn't sound good. But we, we throw anti-metabolites, such as mitomycin C, 5-FU, you know, onto this patient's eye during surgery, and then that keeps the eye from healing. Well. I don't know about you, but most of the time my body's healed me. It's been a good thing, right? And indeed, when we keep the eye from healing, what allows that bleb to stay also allows bacteria to potentially enter, breaks through this tissue, which can't heal. And so patients who have trabeculectomy are at a lifetime risk of infection. That infection, ne that risk never goes away as long as they have an active bleb. So their trabeculectomy is working, 
by definition, they're at risk for infection. Now, in the past, this may not have been a big deal. Why? Because most people who get glaucoma are a bit older. And back before the baby boomers, you were older, you were in a walker, you were in bed watching TV. You were, I mean, this, you know, people weren't as active. Well, now we've got all these active seniors with glaucoma. And, you know, having something that could give them a lifetime risk of infection or limit their lifestyles is not something they're going to be interested in having, right? I mean, I just had a patient of mine who's in his 60s. He's a big wave surfer. He surfs waves that are twice as high as the ceiling. Okay? You tell a surfer that he's going to have to stop surfing, you might as well just, you know, give him an overdose of morphine because he's not going to want to live. Um, so this surgery, which has been with us for you know, 50 years, is, is now no longer an appropriate surgery for many of our patients. And so we really need something else. Okay. Um, so glaucoma drainage devices. So many people don't know, glaucoma drainage devices actually appeared on scene around the same time as trabeculectomy did. Uh, they also have a very interesting history, and I enjoy the kind of interesting stories of history, which is funny because when I was a student, I hated history. It was dry and dusty, and probably because that's the way it was, it was taught. But, you know, now we've discovered, you know, through the wonderful PBS documentaries that, well, history can be pretty interesting, and it is, and it's true in our own fields, right? Glaucoma drainage devices also have an interesting history. The first drainage devices out there were called cetons. Cetons are basically just um, a, a filament, something that you put in a position to keep a hole open. So they're not tubes, they don't have any lumen inside them, they're just, a, they're, they're just something, it's a placeholder. And some of the earliest cetons that were described in the literature include horsehair, glass, and then every precious metal you can think of. Um, but none of them really worked so well. So they all basically scarred down or became infected, uh, or the cetons basically were extruded. So glaucoma drainage devices were the next step. And what really uh, made glaucoma drainage devices work is that instead of just putting a kind of tube in the eye and letting fluid flow from the anterior chamber underneath the subconjunctiva, the key is that there's a plate. So essentially, a, a reservoir forms. Right? So the fluid moves through the tube onto the plate and then out, usually through uh, subconjunctival space, into the drainage vessels. Now, the problem with glaucoma drainage devices is that it can be difficult, just as with trabeculectomy, to achieve that right balance. Because the tubes that we currently use with glaucoma drainage devices are all so, the lumens are so large that there's really no significant restriction to flow. If you just put them in and let the fluid go, everyone's going to be hypotenuse. And indeed, that's one of the issues with glaucoma drainage devices, which is why with bar belts, we have to tie it off for a period of time and basically sit there and wait <laughs> while, while it opens up, which means, of course, that the pressure's too high during that time. Or with the Ahmed, there's actually a valve, which does restrict the flow a bit. And in the lab, it works beautifully in terms of flow restriction. But in humans, for some reason, you can still get hypotony. So early on after surgery, you can still get too much flow, even though there's a valve or a flow restrictor that should, in theory, keep it from going too low. And then, of course, there's the issue that a month or so out, most patients who have glaucoma drainage devices end up with what we call a hypertensive phase. Well, the body is going to heal around this. And as it does so, you end up with more restriction to the outflow and you can actually end up with a hypertensive phase before the healing process is completed. And then, of course, it depends on how the body heals long term. If somebody develops a very thick wall of fibrous tissue around these devices, you're not going to end up with a good long term result. And then there's, there's all the issues of just an implant. And this is true of any implant you put in the eye or anywhere else in the body. The implants can move. 
right? Implants can get infected, and in an, an implant that gets infected has to be removed, right? Uh, scarring can result in uh, things like restriction uh, of, the, of the tissue around these implants, and at least in the case of the bar belt, which sits underneath the extraocular muscles, you can end up with double vision. Okay. So, so these are the, the basic glaucoma treatments that we've had available for decades. And for those who have severe glaucoma and there's nothing else that we can really offer and we're facing loss of vision, it's been a trade-off we've been willing to accept. We've been willing to accept it. I'm not so sure that our patients have been so willing. Um, but in the past, patients were also much more likely to just do what their doctors told them. That's no longer the case. And I personally am getting more and more patients when told that they need trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage device just say, no, I won't have it. And I'd rather go blind. And uh, I just had somebody in my office the other day. It was... Uh, a little stressful for me because she was adamant she didn't want trabeculectomy and her and her son were arguing <laughs> in front of me. He was telling her she was going to go blind and I was agreeing she would if she didn't have her pressure lowered. Um, you know, fortunately, she did have other options, but I mean, prior to coming and seeing me, the only option she had been given was trabeculectomy. Um, and her surgeon was not willing to even consider any other options. So, you know, we have to be willing now to accept that we need to work with our patients. And they do have the right to determine what happens to their eye, just like they have that right to determine what happens to any other part of their body. And we may not agree with their decision. Um, so it's, it's good now that we have a number of these newer technologies and procedures that we're going to be talking about. So this is just the, uh, you know, a couple of the, the risks of glaucoma drainage device. Here's a tube that's eroding through the cornea. This here is a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. This can happen after any glaucoma surgery, but it's more likely after trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage devices because there's the potential that your pressure could end up too low. If your pressure is too low, you can actually end up with the choroidal vessels leaking or bursting. And this is a, a blinding condition, the suprachoroidal hemorrhage. So, <clears throat> so let's move on to some of the, the newer uh, technologies. Um, this one here, cyclophotocoagulation is considered to be minimally invasive, so technically it fits in what we call the MIGS criteria, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. Now you may all recall uh, the, the photocoagulation um, of the ciliary body that was done externally, and that was a very painful procedure used only for end-stage glaucoma because it was completely untitratable. Right? It either worked so ridiculously well that you ended up with a tysicle eye, or it didn't work at all. <laughs> so it was really the older style ciliary process, ablative procedures, um, was really just for treating pain, you know, truly in stage blind painful eyes. Well, fortunately, we now have an endoscopic technique. And it's, it's pretty cool. Let me show you. We've got a video of it here. So this is an animation of the procedure. Generally, it's done after cataract surgery. It's endoscopic, so you can see you've got this on the monitor up here. And uh, you can see as the animation uh, essentially just fries these ciliary processes. And, and they just shrink, right? And the whole purpose is to ablate or destroy the ciliary processes which are producing aqueous. So if you can't get the aqueous to drain properly, the other option is well, let's keep the aqueous from being produced. A um, couple of issues, as you might anticipate with this, is how do you titrate it? <laughs> you know? And the, nobody really knows. This, this procedure here, the endocyclophotocoagulation, ECP, um, is hard to titrate. 
if you don't get enough of these ciliary processes, essentially, you know, nothing happens. You get no result. If you get too many, which fortunately with ECP is hard to do, it's hard to get too many, um, then you could end up actually with hypotony. Um, the real issues with ECP is that there aren't that many studies out, so we really don't know how well it works. It seems to be pretty effective for mild to moderate glaucoma. Uh, it's a good procedure for patients who are having cataract surgery or have already had cataract surgery because as you can see you have to place this uh, this probe here between the iris and the lens in this in this sulcus and if you've got a natural lens you're going to ding it you're going to end up with a cataract so this isn't something that you do in a phacic patient uh, the other issue is that uh, you've got to shrink these processes but you don't want to get them to the point where they pop and they're really, they're a bit like popcorn in that, you know, they'll shrink and then suddenly they'll, they'll pop. And if they pop, you've just created a huge inflammatory reaction, which can be quite troublesome. And you can actually end up with significant pressure spikes. Then the last thing is it's not cheap. You have to get your surgery center to be willing to, to spend the, I think this is about a forty to $60,000 unit, I, you know, it depends on what kind of deal that you can work, but um, but most surgery centers just aren't willing to, to invest in this. So then uh, along comes trabectome. Now this is kind of an interesting procedure because with pediatric glaucoma, uh, what you do often is you'll go in with a device and you'll rip open the trabecular meshwork, right? So um, you call it a uh, goniotomy or trabeculotomy, depending on what approach you take. But in adults, it doesn't work so well. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, but one of the reasons is that we scar down. So you open up that, that trabecular meshwork. You've got Schlem's canal, the anterior chamber. But those two leaflets of the remaining trabecular meshwork tend to zipper up. And then you lose your effect. So with trabectome, what was done was uh, a probe was designed that essentially creates a small little plasma. And these electrodes are passed into the trabecular meshwork. It ablates the trabecular meshwork in such a way that, in theory, less scarring occurs. Now this is another one of those procedures that is generally only done with cataract surgery or after cataract surgery because you're passing this probe across the pupil. And if you ding the lens, you're going to ding it in the center, you're going to get a cataract. So it turns out that this procedure gets the pressure into the upper teens. So for somebody with mild to moderate glaucoma, it can be a, it can be a nice procedure to offer. So. It does, however, limit future surgical options. Okay, you've just ablated the trabecular meshwork. So any future surgical option that requires that you have a patent canal or trabecular meshwork is no longer an option. Um, now, why is that important? Because I'm going to go over a number of procedures that are newer procedures that require that. So the latest buzz, the latest FDA-approved glaucoma procedure is the eye stent. And a lot of people have been really excited about the eye stent. And in Canada, Ike Ahmed, who is an outstanding surgeon, has been a big proponent of the eye stent. And for him, I think it works pretty well. And I'll tell you why it may work better for him in Canada than it would for us here in the US. So what happens with the eye stent? It, uh, why didn't that? Uh so this is actually Ike Ahmed's uh, procedure, and uh, we'll just. So this this is uh, gonio gonioscopic surgery. So that's a gonio prism, and this little device is the stent. It's a little snorkel-like device, and that there is the trabecular mesh work, and uh, we will. So what we're seeing here is the trabecular mesh work, and he's taking this stent and he's pushing it in through the trabecular mesh work, and there it goes, right into the canal, so Schlem's canal. 
Once it's in Schlem's canal, he's going to release it, and you see a little blood reflux out. And that's because, remember that the canal is connected to the collector channels, which is connected to the venous system. So when you actually open up the system, you can get some reflux of blood. And that reflux of blood is a good thing. That shows you that you've actually gotten into the system, and the system is patent. Okay. So now here's where um, things differ between here and in Canada. In Canada, you can put in multiple of these little stents. Here in the US, they're only FDA approved for one at the time of cataract surgery. So Ike Ahmed's been getting great results from putting in these little stents, but he'll put in three, four at a time. Okay. And uh, you can see, I mean, it's, it's really, it's pretty neat to watch here. And you can see that reflux, so you know there's good flow. And here at the, the end of the case, uh, and here I think he's going to put another one in even. Uh, yeah, here he goes with the third one. It just couldn't do this here. Uh, and I'll tell you why. But um, once he puts it in, he's going to show you the actual flow through the system using some dye. So we'll put some dye in the eye and you'll see the flow out through the collector channel system, and it's pretty impressive. But the issue is that these stents are a thousand bucks each. Okay? They're made out of surgical grade titanium, ounce per ounce, ounce for ounce. These are one of the most expensive things that you can possibly purchase. I, I think that the only thing more expensive than these by weight is antimatter. <laughs> so, uh, so here he goes. He's he's putting in this, and you see the blue dye go through there. It's here. He's going to do it again, right there. You see that? That's really it's neat. So you see this? You think, wow. Okay, it's it's a neat procedure. It's low risk. It's not very uh, invasive. You know, the thinking is that the eye stint is a good technique for somebody who's having cataract surgery with ocular hypertension or mild open angle glaucoma can be done with cataract surgery, so you're already there. Um, but the problem is, is that it can potentially limit future surgeries. You're putting this tiny little stent in. If it works really well, well great. Who cares about future surgeries? But if you're going to need future surgeries, such as you know, canal-based surgeries, and you know, a lot of the really exciting surgeries that we either have now or will have are canal-based, uh, you, know, you don't want to close a door on something that's going to work really well with something that, well, Let's see how well it works, shall we? Oh, and then it's also, like I said, it's expensive. At a thousand bucks a pop, um, you know, who's going to pay for that? So, does it really enhance? The whole point of the eye stent is to create an opening from the anterior chamber into the canal from the trabecular, you know, through the trabecular meshwork. Remember, this is a really tiny little lumen. Well. Let's see, the, uh, the results, one year out, cataract surgery alone, 50% of patients who had elevated pressures re ended up with a pressure below 22 millimeters of mercury, cataract surgery alone. Cataract surgery plus the eye stent, 72%. Okay, well there's a couple of ways to look at that. You can look at that and say, holy cow, cataract surgery treats glaucoma in 50% of patients, right? And I mean, that's what most of us saw. Um, to me, 72 versus 50% just wasn't that impressive, you know, especially for something that is expensive, may not be covered by insurance, could close doors on future options. So this is one of the reasons why I've not uh, started implanting these things. Now, I comment again, he's learned that when you implant multiple stents, not surprisingly, you get more flow, you get the stents in near the collector channel system, uh, you get a better result. But it's very important with these that you place them, he's, he's learned, you have to place them where the patent collector channels are for this to work. So okay, so one year out, maybe you'll say, well, that's good enough for me, my insurance pays for it, it's easy, it's low risk. Hey, 72% versus 50%, I'll do it. What about two years out? Two years out, published results, cataract surgery alone, 61% of patients ended up with a pressure reduction of less than 22 millimeters of mercury. The eye stent, 71%. Well, now you say, well, it's still 10% more. Ah, but wait. That difference was not statistically significant. 
which means this doesn't mean anything. It's 10% may not be a real difference. Could just be a, a, you know, you could redo the study and see those two flipped. So two years out, my reading of this is the eye stent doesn't work. Doesn't buy you anything extra than cataract surgery alone. So again, if you've got patients who, you know, have insurance that's paying for it and they're low risk for progressing to more advanced glaucoma, it's like an insurance policy. But if they're paying out of pocket, I really don't see that there's that that it, they're getting much of value. So canaloplasty is the one surgery that I truly believe enhances flow without adding significant extra risk and without having the downsides of the more traditional surgeries while still achieving pressure lowering in the range of glaucoma drainage devices. And so this is a very, very exciting procedure, both to perform uh, as well as uh, to talk about. So let me go over what canaloplasty is. Canaloplasty is based on an earlier type of surgery called viscocanalostomy, which was basically a dilation of the natural drainage system, the Schlem's canal. It's essentially angioplasty for the eye. So this uh, animation is just reviewing what we already know. The ciliary processes produce aqueous fluid. It drains out through Schlem's canal. Now, much of the literature suggests that for most open angle glaucoma patients, it's the trabecular meshwork that is the limiting factor. There's something in the trabecular meshwork that's blocking the flow. So with canaloplasty, a flap is created. And this catheter, that's the world's smallest catheter, it's, it's really cool to actually see it during surgery, is passed through Schlimm's canal out the flap. And then once it's out, a suture is tied to the tip of that stent. That stent is then brought back through, and as it's brought back through, viscoelastic, usually Helon or Helon GV, is used to dilate the canal. So as with angioplasty, instead of using a balloon as you would for the heart, we use a viscoelastic. And then instead of using a, a uh, springy little device in the uh, heart vessels, we use this suture and we tension it. So like a hoodie, it's pulled in, opens up the canal. Okay. So then the question is, well, that sounds really cool, but how well does it work? And is it really less risky? Well, it really is less risky, and it does work, and we're going to go over that right now. Uh, so the things that patients like about this, it's non-penetrating. You're not making a hole on, in the eye. And I can't tell you how many patients come to me telling me that they don't want that procedure that puts a hole in their eye, right? Um, and I don't blame them. There's no bleb. If there's no hole, there's no bleb. Now, you'll hear some people who don't perform canaloplasty say, oh, we've heard they end up with blebs anyway. Early on after canaloplasty, because you are making a flap, if you get a lot of flow, you'll end up with, with a bleb. I do not have any patients in the hundreds of canaloplasties that I perform that have blebs that have, have maintained, right? Just don't. Uh, I have a couple of patients who have maybe a low-line kind of chemosis, but, but that's it. And that's probably through kind of a transscleral process of uh, fluid moving out. But the key thing about no bleb is no bleb means no restrictions on lifestyle activities. You want to go big wave surfing? Go big wave surfing. I have another patient who's a, a llama farmer. Right? She was told she'd have to sell her farm because she needed trabeculectomy. Right? She loves her llamas. Right? That's her life. So, you know, fortunately, she had canal plasty. Now she's she's out in the dirt with her llamas. It's no big deal. She's at no extra risk for infection. Um, contact lenses, not an issue. No bleb. You want to wear soft contact lenses afterwards? Go right ahead. Okay. It's safer than traditional surgeries. We'll go over that. Uh, but really, it's the, it's the proactive lifestyle. Patients love knowing two things. Okay, our modern well-educated patients like to know that they're going to be able to maintain their active lifestyle and they like to know that what we're doing 
is physiologic, is natural, enhancing, right? They don't like stuff in the eye, on the eye, elsewhere. They don't like things that are creating uh, changes in our anatomy that aren't, aren't natural. And so this really appeals to many of the modern glaucoma patients. So the question then is, does it work? Well, here we have, this was by Ike Ahmed. Right? So again, he's, he's uh, just an incredibly well-respected uh, surgeon. He's taught me a lot. He, he and his, uh, I believe these were residents or fellows, actually evaluated it. They took a look at patients who had canaloplasty and compared them to trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. And that's very important to note because uh, the mitomycin C is really what allows trabeculectomy to work so well and to keep the pressure lower. Okay? Well, here you've got one, one year after surgery, canaloplasty patients 13.4 millimeters of mercury, trabeculectomy 12.3. And you might jump on that and say, ha, ah, there's an extra point of lowering. Okay. Well, actually, it turns out that this is not statistically significant. <laughs> okay? So there's really no difference. But, but let's say it was a millimeter difference. I grant you that. You got a millimeter of extra difference for that trabeculectomy. Well, what did you pay to get that millimeter of difference? Because Nothing's for free. You pay for everything, whether you pay for it with, with money or risk. And in the case of surgery, ex, every extra millimeter of mercury that you get from something like trabeculectomy or tube is paid for with risk. And what are the risks that we're looking at? Um, loss of vision. How about that? 2% in canaloplasty, 16% in trabeculectomy. The whole point of glaucoma surgery is to save vision. What are we doing? to these patients. Well, clearly, the patients that end up with trabeculectomy in general, we feel are going to lose vision anyway. So we're just trying to slow it down. But still, look at that difference, 2% versus 16%. Um, oh, I, I passed over this, but this is worth noting too. Uh, the number of medications needed to achieve that pressure lowering after canaloplasty, 0.6. After trabeculectomy, 0.7. So no difference in the number of medications needed a year out. So let's take a look at the other risks of surgery. Hypotony, we talked about that, trabeculectomy, gets the pressure down really low, that's what everybody says, nothing else is gonna get the pressure down in the single digits below 10. Okay, well fine, but that also means if you're below 10, you're pretty near that hypotony risk, and hypotony can result in hypotony maculopathy. You think maybe that up to 20% risk of hypotony maculopathy with trabeculectomy here, might be contributing to the loss of vision. How about other things that we don't necessarily think of as huge risks, but in our patients' lives, it makes a big difference to them. Chronic irritation from blood. Well, with canaloplasty, there's no blood, no irritation. I've actually had patients who have had canaloplasty. Their ocular surface disease improves because you get them off some or all of their medications they feel better. Their eyes less irritated. And I've even had patients, I don't tell them to expect this, but I've even had patients whose best corrected visual, vision improves after canaloplasty. Okay? You're not going to see that with a trabeculectomy because you've got this bleb which messes up the tear film, results in dysthesia, right? so irritation. Bleb leak, again, not expected with a bleb-free surgery. 4% per year of patients with trabeculectomy with mitomycin C can end up with bleb leaks. A bleb leak puts you at risk for infection, puts you at risk for loss of vision. Vision threatening eye infection, well, we just talked about that. Not with canaloplasty, yes, with uh, trabeculectomy. Cataract formation, here's an interesting thing. The cataract formation after canaloplasty appears to be on par with just the natural progression of cataracts. With trabeculectomy, uh, one of my favorite attendings uh, made the statement that with trabeculectomy, five years out from surgery, your patients are more likely to have developed a cataract than they are to have had their intraocular pressure well controlled. Now, think about that for a moment. That's a, that's a crazy statement. But the literature actually supports it. 
Five years out from trabeculectomy, 50% of trabeculectomies will have failed. They have about a 10% per year failure rate. Okay? Whereas with cataracts, 78% of your patients who have had trabeculectomy will end up with a cataract five years out. And that kind of puts you behind the eight ball because cataract surgery increases the risk of trabeculectomy failure, right? So there's just no winning with trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Um, I had another attending who told me that it's very important that academic glaucoma specialists change institutions every five years. <laughs> that way you'll never know what a failure you've been. <laughs> and, you know, if this is your mainstay of surgery, trabeculectomy, I can understand that. All right, so how about the three-year results? That was one year. The three-year results, people will ask, well, okay, one year, lots of things look good in one year. But what happened, I mean, even the eye stent seemed to be okay in terms of the difference between cataract surgery and the eye stent plus cataract surgery. But two years out, no significant difference. Canaloplasty three-year data are good. Okay. Canaloplasty alone, 34% okay, had a uh, mean IOP decrease versus baseline here. So that's a rather 34% decrease. And there was a 50% reduction in the number of drops. Now here's the neat thing, is unlike trabeculectomy, which doesn't play so well with cataract surgery, canaloplasty actually works better when it's done with cataract surgery. Okay. When you combine canaloplasty with cataract surgery, you get a 42% mean reduction in pressure, 81% mean reduction in drops, and this is really outstanding. Almost 9 out of 10 patients are drop-free three years out from canaloplasty without the risk of a, of a bleb, without the risk of infection, without chronic irritation. Almost 90% of patients who have cataract surgery and canaloplasty are drop-free. Okay. So this is Robert Stegman. He's the, uh, the father of canaloplasty. And, you know, he's, he's just a, a really interesting guy. He, he likes to call himself a, a bush doctor. He works in South Africa, and he sees patients that come to him, right, South African patients, these patients keloid, they, they scar down, they do not do well with trabeculectomy. The blebs almost always fail. Not only that, but he sees them, and then they go back out into the bush, and he doesn't see them for a while, so follow-up's horrible. You know? And also, they're out in the bush. That's not a good place to have a, 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 a cystic bleb that can potentially get infected. So he developed this, this procedure. And you know, he felt very strongly, and this is, this is a quote of his, that it is vital to find a safer, more predictable operation with preferably no complications at all. And he felt that canalplasty, as he says, this is the closest I have ever come to that. This is a surgeon who has the most challenging patients you will ever see, right? And he feels that canaloplasty is the closest to the ideal that he's been able to achieve. And so that, that really says a lot for this procedure. Um, so we've gone through the, the treatments that are currently available and FDA approved, uh, kind of through the, uh, the risks and the benefits and uh, you know, the appropriateness of each one. But now let's take a look at the promising treatments the ones that are not yet FDA approved. And uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find where did the other is. And some of these are actually approved in Europe. Uh, so we do have some early results, not just uh, uh, the uh, FDA study results. So we can categorize these into um, a couple of, of separate categories. One is what we call trabecular micro bypass stents. Okay? And actually the eye stent would fit in this category. It's, it's going to bypass the trabecular meshwork. So create an opening between the anterior chamber and Schlem's canal. 
suprachoroidal implants. We're not talked about this yet because we don't have anything that's available that does this, but it turns out that when you perform surgery on the eye or you have trauma to the eye and the iris and the ciliary body separate, right, and you get what's called a cleft, the pressure drops, usually drops into the single digits. The problem, of course, is that these things uh, usually heal, or you actually try to get them to heal because you can't keep your patients in single digits for too long. The pressure shoots way up into the 40s or 50s or 60s. So attempts in the past to surgically create clefts have not been very successful because they've been very hard to titrate. So there are now stents that have been created to essentially find a way to get the fluid down into the suprachoroidal space where there's actually a, an almost like a vacuum pulling the fluid out. Right? So there's a negative pressure in that space and it can be very effective in terms of lowering the pressure, but how do you control it? How do you titrate it? And then the subconjunctival implants. Uh, subconjunctival implants are essentially methods of trying to get a better, more controllable, safer trabeculectomy. Okay, so in my way of thinking, these are actually the least exciting, but but it's it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. Okay. So this here is the hydrus microstent. The hydrus microstent. What this does is it's a stent that goes through here, the trabecular meshwork, and stents open all right, the Schlem's canal for a number of clock hours. It's about the size of an eyelash, and it scaffolds it open. So unlike the, the eye stent, which just creates a little hole and then just a little, little stent there, this is really stenting it open for a significant portion. Still not as much as canaloplasty, but um, this is one of these things that can be done faster than canaloplasty, ab interno, so from within the eye rather than through the sclera, ab externo. And so for that reason, it's rather exciting. So here we go. We can see here is the canal. And notice that the canal already has blood in it. So we know that there's patency between the canal, Schlem's canal, and the collector channel system. But glaucoma, in most cases, open angle glaucoma is due to a restriction here at the trabecular meshwork. So what's happening here, and you can see this is probably a little bit more challenging to put in than an eye stent. This is a bigger device, and what you need to do is create that opening, and then this device is just threaded into the canal, and then the, uh, the inserter is removed. And again, this is, uh, this is Ike Ahmed up in, in uh, Canada. And you know, he and I have shared some mutual patients, and I, I'd love to go up and, and see him operate one of these days. I, I just think he's, he's a very elegant surgeon. So what you see here is, is you can see this reflux of blood into, into the canal. It has these little windows here. Uh, and so this is something that, that I would love to see here in the US, because I think it would really take what we've got with the eye stand and provide a significant extra benefit here in terms of how well it works. Now, yes. So let's move on to the suprachoroidal implants. So one of the earliest suprachoroidal implants is what's called the Solex gold microshunt. And in theory, it made a lot of sense. You take these two thin gold plates uh, and you sandwich them together with little channels in between them. And the idea was that the body shouldn't really react to gold. It's pretty inert. Um, and you would place this shunt right here in the angle in the suprachoroidal space. And fluid would come in from here and then out these little pores. You see these little channels here. And it would allow fluid to, to just flow out. And in theory, because the body doesn't react to gold as much as it does to other types of metals, uh, it shouldn't scar down. And you shouldn't get fibrotic tissue plugging up these, these channels. 
Well, you know, just as the theory of argon, laser trabeculoplasty, and Karn's original desire uh, for trabeculectomy didn't quite pan out, uh, neither has this panned out. The, the gold shunt has really been unimpressive. Uh, only a modest IOP lowering, uh, medication reducing at best. So you might get some patients off of medication, but it's unlikely they're going to get a big pressure reduction. Benefits seem to be time limited, so eventually it does. These channels seem to get plugged up. And once they get plugged up, you lose the effect. Uh, so there's a very high rate of failure, and they've actually had some that have been explanted. So they've gone back in, taken them out, taken a look at them under the microscope, and seen that, yeah, the body, you know, we may value gold, but the body doesn't seem to really <laughs> value it as much as we do. So what else could we do? Well, um, there's a company that has created a silicon material. So instead of using gold, they use silicon. You, know, you might say, well, silicon, you know, silicon isn't that somewhat pro-inflammatory. Well, certain types of silicon, you know, can be. Um, but this, this particular silicon biomaterial, they've created these tiny little micro pores in it. And let me show you the, the procedures a bit involved here. Uh, so it remains to be seen whether this is going to become really popular because all of the focus in glaucoma at this point seems to be, you know, how fast can I do it? Uh, can I do it without creating a scleral incision? But so what you see here is, and this also is, is going to make most surgeons kind of queasy because you see what's happening here. You've got this flap, and now he's freehanding it right into uh, the suprachoroidal space. So he's cut down to the choroid, and at least when I was a resident, if we ever saw choroid, our heart stopped, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> and he just stuck this, this device into the choroid, you know, creating a potential space, which, uh, you know, again, I see choroid a fair amount doing canaloplasty, but I, this, would, this would make me a little bit nervous. So now he's going to gently, delicately pass the star flow implant between the sclera and the suprachoroidal space. So now the, um, uh, the keratome has just been used to create an incision underneath the superficial flap into the anterior chamber. And what's going to be done is this tag here is going to be placed in the anterior chamber and then the flap will be placed back down. So this star flow device with these micropores will allow fluid to flow from the anterior chamber through these micropores into this suprachoroidal space here, right? So it's a pretty, pretty neat idea. Um, but again, the question is, even if it works, is this something that's going to take off? Because I'm going to show you now some things that I think are really neat. Okay. This here is the iStent Supra. Uh, it's not yet available in the US. And I may not be a fan of the iStent, what I showed you earlier as far as the trabecular micro bypass. But I'm really excited about the iStent Supra and another one that I'll show you called the Psypass Supracoidal Implant. Because these are just simple, elegant, uh, fast, and they seem to work. So the iStent Supra uh, is basically a, a small tube with a, a special uh, material here that would go into the supracoidal space with a titanium collar here. And so far, the initial studies have been impressive. When these have been implanted, either alone or at the time of cataract surgery, at 12 months, one study showed a pressure reduction of 20%. Well, that's pretty good. Another study at 18 months showed an almost 50% reduction in pressure. So somewhere between 20 and 50%, I'll take that. Now, so here you're going to see why this compared to the star flow is so exciting. <clears throat> so what we see here, uh, and this is uh, Dr. Jose Belda, is a gonioscopic view, and he's inserting it right now, right now, into the angle there. So 
little device, and there it is. Bam. <laughs> you can see the collar sticking out. That's titanium collar. The rest of it is in the suprachoroidal space. So whereas the star flow required cutting down, you know, <laughs> putting something down, waving it along the suprachoroidal space, uh, the ice tint supra just injected into that space. And so this is uh, really a, a very elegant device. There's also a competing device, and uh, it's called the SciPass Micro Stent. It's also a tube. This tube has little, little micro holes in it, but it's the same idea. You can see here's the angle, there's the iris, and you just shove it into the suprachoroidal space, right? I mean, it's really, it's, it may be elegant, but what you're doing is shoving it into the suprachoroidal space. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, but <laughs> it's a small space. Uh, so then the, uh, the other remaining devices are essentially subconjunctival implants. These are implants that are designed to restrict the flow from the anterior chamber through the sclera under the conjunctiva just as trabeculectomy would. So instead of creating a flap, and then you know, trying to tie it down just right so you get some percolation of fluid. These are actually designed to restrict flow so that you get enough flow that the pressure is lowered, but not so much that you have problems with hypotony. Okay? But they are essentially modified trabeculectomies. You're just not necessarily uh, making the same types of incisions. Now, the in-focus micro, micro shunt uh, received a lot of press recently because some early results came out that looked good, but this does currently requiring an it does currently require an external incision, cutting through the conjunctiva, cutting down, creating a small flap in the sclera, uh, much smaller than you would for trabeculectomy. Um, but it's still trabeculectomy. You still you you would expect that you're still going to need to use anti-metabolites. Uh, such as uh, mitomycin C or 5-FU for, for it to work. Bleb disappears, it disappears. This one here, though, is, is pretty neat. I mean, if you want something that's going to give you uh, flow through this into the subconjunctival space, I think the, G the Zen 45 uh, gel stent is, is pretty neat. So we'll take a look at this video here. So you can see it's this little implant right here. You take this this needle, double vel bevel needle, through the anterior chamber, you're passing it into the subconjunctival space, and what you're going to do is inject this uh, gel stent, and it's going to create, essentially, flow from the subconjunctival space into the supra, you know, the uh, right over the sclera underneath the conjunctiva. And the neat thing about this stent is they spent a lot of time engineering and designing it to make sure that the stent would maintain enough stiffness to keep the space open, but have enough flexibility so that when it hit the, that subconjunctival space, it would just kind of rotate down along the natural curvature of the, uh, of the sclera and not poke through the conjunctiva. But again, this is, is something that most likely will require some kind of help keeping that blub open. Um, so for that reason, I'm not as excited about the gel stent as I am any procedure that does not require a blab or anti-metabolites. So this is essentially what we'd call an ab interno trabeculectomy. Um, it's not really a trabeculectomy because you're not uh, removing the trabecular tissue, but the idea is the same. You're, you're creating a fistula. Okay. And so far the IOP reduction looks pretty good at 12 months, 31 to 42 percent, but compare back to what I showed you with canaloplasty, um, it's in the same range. Canaloplasty doesn't require a, a bleb. So what do I consider the most promising? Um, Interestingly enough, this is something that was just presented 
at a conference a month ago. And I do think this is the most promising of the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. And it's FDA approved. And it's essentially canalplasty, but with a really elegant twist. Whereas canalplasty, in the traditional method that it's been performed using Stegman's approach, requires making an external incision, a flap, and is a very long, tedious surgery. And one of the reasons why it's not taken off, even though it works as well as it does, it's not taken off because it just takes too long to do, right? Um, ab interno canalplasty, right, or minimally invasive canalplasty surgery, does all of the things that canaloplasty does, with the exception of leaving the proline suture in the canal. So you get trabecular meshwork treated, because an opening is created with ab interno. Schlem's canal is dilated. Collector channel systems are also reopened. You get better aqueous outflow. And for those who are worried about leaving things in the eye, even if it's just a proline suture, and I do have patients who don't want the proline suture, I'll say, I think it works better if you stitch it open. They say, I don't want it in the eye. I want nothing in the eye. This is, this is going to be a really great option. So this is uh, Mark Gallardo actually um, developed this technique. And let me show you this video. It's uh, really elegant. So he's just completed cataract surgery injects some viscoelastic in the eye. Now, normally, canaloplasty now, we'd create an incision right here, open up the conjunctiva, start uh, creating a flap. What he's going to do is he's just going to create a, an oblique incision at the limbus through the cornea into the anterior chamber. And you'll see why he makes it in this direction rather than our usual kind of tangential. So what he's going to do shortly is uh, insert the catheter, place a gonio lens. I'm sorry, I could have probably sped this up a bit. I believe that this is actually a real-time video. I can't, I can't remember whether he said it was or not. So there's the catheter. It's the same catheter that we use for traditional canaloplasty. He places it through that small little incision, and he's going to place it up in the angle here. This here is where... Uh, the catheter is actually going to enter the canal. So again, instead of cutting down and entering the canal from the external approach, he's going to, you're going to see in this video in just a moment how he's going to get this catheter into the canal from the internal approach and actually dilate the entire canal from the inside. So being gonioscopic surgery, put a little viscoelastic, um, you have to tilt the head. There are a couple of little uh, uh, maneuvers that you have to perform. And yeah, I do believe that this is a real, real-time video. So what he's showing you there is that that's just a, a pair of, I believe, a capsular rexus forceps or bent needle cystotome. So it's a, it's a piece of, of surgical equipment that every cataract surgeon out there has. Okay? So you don't need to buy special equipment for this. Okay? So unlike, say, trabeculotome or something, there, there's no expensive equipment to buy. You take that, he's going to create a tiny little, just creating a tiny little opening in the trabecular meshwork. And you see how immediately you get reflux? I mean, this is visual proof. Whenever you see these uh, minimally invasive surgeries, and you see that, that to me is just proof that yes, it is the trabecular meshwork that's the problem. So now he's taking some micro forceps and just threading that catheter through the canal. And he's going to thread it all the way around. And you can see here, here it is. You're, you're looking through the sclera at the blinking tip of the micro catheter as it's passing around Schlem's canal. And not every surgeon has these micro forceps, but you know they're six to six hundred to thousand dollars. So I mean, it's not like you're paying fifty thousand dollars for for an in instrument to do something. So now he's got the tip right there, and what he's going to do at this point is he'll place 
going to reorient so that he can, he can see what he needs to at the microscope. He's going to place another instrument right here to act as a fulcrum. So this instrument will keep the catheter from ripping through the trabecular meshwork as he pulls it back out and dilates the canal. So there's the blinking red tip of the catheter. And it actually is, um, I think, pretty cool to see. This is real time, unedited. And see, th this, is, this is really fast. It's, it's something that, that uh, any skilled cataract surgeon could do. It's not technically that challenging. If you can put an eye stent in, you can do this. Uh, but as I show you, you would expect a significantly better result, so at least from the early studies. So now he's just removing the catheter, and as he's doing so, his technician is, is slowly injecting viscoelastic to dilate that canal and reopen the collector channel system. And that's it. He's done. So, and uh, that, that's pretty much it in terms of uh, what there is to see on that video. So, how well does it work? Well, these are Dr. Gallardo's uh, results here. And again, this procedure is uh, something that's just been developed as an enhancement of canaloplasty. Canaloplasty has been available for a number of years. We have long term results with the ab external canaloplasty, they look really good, at least three years out. The ab internal canaloplasty actually looks really good early on. And so again, he's only been doing this for about six months, so he's only got a few patients out six months. Um, but he's got a total of 70 patients here. They started out with pressure around 20 on over two medications. And uh, you can see at one month, around 14 millimeters of mercury on one half medication. So every other person had none versus one. Uh, three months out, maintained at uh, 13 millimeters of mercury, and six months, 12.3 millimeters of mercury. And so the six month, the three and the six month uh, points are really important points because most glaucoma surgeries, there's still some healing going on for the first three months. So I generally tell my patients, we don't really know whether your surgery was a success or failure until we're three months out. Once you get three months out, we can feel pretty good about it. And you can feel even better six months out. He's actually uh, taken a look to see, well, of these patients, how many patients actually ended up with no medications at all, and what were their pressures? And you can see that a fair number of these patients, so 54 out of the you know, 70 patients, ended up in his study so far with no medications. And you can see that you know, their pressures are doing very, very well in the 11 to 13 and change range. So it's, it's still very, very early in terms of uh, knowing will ab interno or minimally invasive canalplasty um, work as well as the ab externo canalplasty. But if we can get the results that are even near the ab external canalplasty with something that's minimally invasive, fast, doesn't require you know, $50,000 upfront investment from the surgery center, uh, my sense is that this could really change the field of how we treat our patients with glaucoma, how early we take them to surgery, um, and you know, could even impact whether all these things that are not yet FDA approved are something that we even want to consider. If every one of these stents that aren't approved comes out, we know what they're all going to cost. Every one of these stents is going to be at about $1,000, if not more, to implant. And so you know, these are things that, that uh, fortunately, I'm not going to be the one that has to make these decisions in terms of what's covered and what's not. And, but it's nice to know that we have all of these potentials, some of which will be FDA approved, others not. Even the ones that are FDA approved are going to take years before they come across our shore. So in the meantime, 
I'm hoping that our patients can benefit from canaloplasty. And whether it's myself doing the surgery or somebody else makes little difference to me. I would just like to see this pick up. And I know that canaloplasty has not been as popular among surgeons simply because of the time constraints and how technically challenging it is. So this to me is, is just incredibly exciting uh, because there's so many patients out there with open angle glaucoma who could benefit from a minimally invasive, effective surgery that doesn't require a huge upfront investment by either the surgery center, the surgeon, or the patient, or the patient's insur insurance. And as of today, most insurances, including Medicare, do now cover canalplasty. Right? Um, <coughs> They don't specify whether it's ab externa or interna. That's not in the, uh, in the coding as far as I, I understand. Um, the only ones that we still have trouble with, and this will come as no surprise to anybody, is Blue Cross. <laughs> but other than Blue Cross, um, patients who have other insurance, including Medicare, uh, canaloplasty is covered. So anyway, I, um, I hope that you share some of my excitement for many of these glaucoma surgeries. I hope that uh, you know, the, the more exciting, more effective surgeries will become FDA approved. But in the meantime, I think it's important to recognize that there are things that we can offer to our patients that are not, right now, as of today, that are not as risky as trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage devices. And I'll now open it up for questions. Oh, by the way, uh, one, one thing before questions, sorry, is uh, uh, just about all of the devices that, are, that I mentioned tonight, I have more detailed um, references, including what the current studies that are available show in terms of how effective they are uh, on, my, on my website here, newglaucomatreatments.com. So if anybody does want to research a bit more, I've, I've done what I can to summarize the currently available research. Uh, I haven't yet added um, the results from the latest conference, which was ARVO, but I'm working on that right now. Yes? You talked about the current ice and placing it in a place where there's heat and alkaline. Yes. Hmm? How do you assess that? That's... <laughs> And that is uh, one, of the, one of the complaints that many of us had about the eye stent early on was we knew, those of us who perform canaloplasty knew very well that not all of the collector channels are open. Right? You perform canaloplasty, uh, you're opening up the whole Schlem's canal. So it doesn't really matter where the collector channels are. And there have been studies that have shown that once you've opened up the canal, through using micro uh, spheres, there's actually flow, circumferential flow, once it's completely open. But before you open it and stent it open, there's not. The flow is segmental. And so if you create a, a trans uh, meshwork bypass into an area that has no active uh, patents channels, you're not doing anything. You might as well just stick it in the wall. Um, there are methods of actually detecting whether there are, are patent channels in the area, and that's one of the videos that ICOMET has that I didn't show tonight, um, is an instructional video for eye stent surgeons on how to assess where these channels are. And he feels very strongly that if you're going to place eye stents, that you have to select where they're placed, not just place them across from your incision, <laughs> but choose that before making the incision so that you can get the optimal flow. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So, at, at internal, you actually pull the catheter out. Mm -hmm. So, you're left with lack of a, the term, archaic kind of a rotor rootering of the meshwork. Uh, right, so what you're doing is you're, you're dialing, kind of like with the way that a um, uh, with ab internal canalplasty, similar to the ab external, you're placing the catheter through the canal, and then on the way out, viscoelastic is, is flowing through the catheter. The catheter has a lumen. Viscoelastic flows through the catheter, 
and dilates the canal, kind of like a balloon does with cardiac angioplasty. So you're opening up the canal, and dilation occurs. You probably also force open some of the connections between the canal and the collector channel system. Um, there appear to be microscopic little valves there that might close up over time. So those are, those are widened. And then you're probably also creating micro openings, perforations in the trabecular meshwork itself. Um, so it's not so much that there's something in there that you kind of have to grind out a roto rooter, but you, but you are reopening a canal that was probably flattened and, and not functioning. Um, there's no stent that's placed. Um, Mark Gallardo tried to using micro forceps to, to find a way to tie the, the stent, the suture, from within the eye, the anterior chamber, and, and he just found that it was, it was too difficult to do. And it makes sense. You're tying something from the outside and cinching it down. Uh, it's a lot easier than trying to tie something from the inside. Right, so with an ab external approach, uh, before you pull the catheter back through the canal, a proline suture is tied to the tip of it. And it's passed back through, the proline suture passes around, and then once it's all the way around, it's, it's essentially cinched. And so that keeps that canal open. Um, and it will be very interesting to see whether that stent, the suture, is providing the additional pressure lowering that we think that it does. I have patients of mine right now who, uh, for one reason or the other, have a stent in one eye, uh, canaloplasty without stent in the other. And almost every one of these patients, the eye that has the stent, has a pressure that's a couple of millimeters of mercury lower than the eye without the stent. So I'm excited about the ab internal canaloplasty, and I'm definitely going to be offering it to my patients, especially those who are having cataract surgery and they're perhaps not of uh, good enough health or you know, would just have difficulty lying still for the extended period of time that, uh, that ab external canaloplasty would take. I think that those are the ideal patients. I'd like to see longer term results before I offer it on par with the ab external. Right now my view is if somebody needs significant lowering, right, they're on maximum tolerated medical therapy, moderate to severe, severe glaucoma with evidence of progression, I'm going to be most comfortable offering ab externo canaloplasty. Um, but again, I'm going to make this decision with the patient. So. I'm not going to be like these surgeons who say it's trabeculectomy or the highway, it's ab external canaloplasty or the highway. If I've got somebody who says, you know, I just, I, I don't think that I, I want that surgery, but I'd like something done to get me off some of the drops, then I, I think ab internal would be great. I also think that anyone out there who is having cataract surgery and is on a couple of drops, and I don't think that cataract surgery alone is going to get them off their medications, um, you know, even if they're not progressing, I think that the ab interno or the minimally invasive canaloplasty would be a great option because it really doesn't add extra risk to the cataract surgery. Now, you're already there. Uh, the risk of infection, not any greater. Uh, there's v very, very little risk of adding minimally invasive canaloplasty. You will get some hyphema, but it's not because anything's bleeding, it's because you've got reflux. And that's all going to go right back out the same way that it came. Uh, so other than perhaps some transient blurred vision from the reflux of fluid back through the canal into the anterior chamber, uh, although that would be annoying, sure, you've just done cataract surgery, we all like to have our you know, patients excited immediately after surgery, and they might not be. Uh, I think that's a, that's a trade-off that would be well worth making. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's just a very broad base of patients who could benefit from the ab interno, the minimally invasive canaloplasty approach. Um, and we, we're not going to have to wait for these, these other very exciting but unavailable things. Yes. Well, those, those two 
So with, uh, with either canaloplasty, uh, ab external or internal, you can do it without um, cataract surgery. And, and that's a very good point because as you saw with almost other, all the other MIGS procedures, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, almost all of those involved a probe passing across the pupillary axis. So it doesn't matter what you do in terms of pulling that pupil down, you're going across it and all it takes is one tiny micro ding and you're done. You've guaranteed yourself a central anterior cataract. End of story. Well, as you saw with, uh, with the video of Mark Gallardo, when you pass the catheter, you're passing it at an oblique angle into the angle. So with, with pupil constriction, you're really at very, very little risk of dinging the natural lens. Not only that, but even if you did happen to do so, it'd be with a silicon catheter, not a metal instrument. Um, so, and we do have experience with, uh, you know, silicon sitting over the natural lens in the phacic IOLs. You know, that's a soft, thin silicon. Uh, most of those patients do very well. Some of them do actually end up with some central anterior cataracts. But, so it's a, both procedures are procedures that could be done either at the time of cataract surgery, before cataract surgery, or after cataract surgery. And that's the other thing that's important to recognize is at least as far as the FDA approval, my understanding is at the moment the eye stent uh, is on label only for at the time of cataract surgery. So if you put an eye stent in at any other time, it's off label, which of course means it might not be covered and all the other issues that are involved with that. Um, so, so canaloplasty, either the traditional or the minimally invasive ab interno can be done and should be covered by, again, most insurances with the exception of Blue Cross. Although I will say that so far we've been able to, um, with significant, <laughs> you know, uh, pursuit, get Blue Cross to pay for most of those patients who have gone on to have canalplasty. I, it sometimes takes a while. Uh, we just got paid for some patients who I performed the surgery before I opted out of Medicare you know, over three years ago, but, uh, <laughs> but eventually you wear them down. Uh, so yes, other, uh, other questions? Yes? Um, the video shows that it's pretty simple and quick, but you mentioned that it's, it takes longer and it's difficult. So I'm what is the difficulty? It seems like it's pretty easy right. to compare to the other procedure. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you feel that way because that's, that's the real key to my excitement about the ab internal canaloplasty. This is going to open it up to all of these surgeons out there who were not willing to take on the, the learning curve of the ab externo canalplasty, uh, but are more than willing to throw an eye stint in randomly into the canal, right? Or into the, uh, yeah, into the angle. And, um, you know, that's frankly where, you know, most of these eye stints that are being done is talking to surgeons out there, they're not taking the, the, route of Ike Ahmed and assessing each, you know, collector channel. They're just going in after surgery and popping it in, right? It's easy. Well, if you can do that, you can do the ab interno canal plasty, right? It's, uh, it's just as easy and it's just as fast, but potentially it will benefit patients far more than, uh, I believe anyway, the, the eye stent. So compare that to canaloplasty, the ab external approach that was that was created by Dr. Stegman. That is a very involved, long, tedious procedure. What you're doing is you're creating a, a superficial flap. Then you're creating a second flap in the sclera underneath that. You have to dissect just above choroid. Okay, and remember we saw with the star flow, uh, the fellow got down to choroid and then took a blunt instrument along choroid. Okay. Now imagine instead taking the sharpest instrument you have, which is what I use, the diamond blade, and creating a plane 50, 50 micrometers above choroid. You don't want to go down into choroid. You definitely don't want to poke 
in the choroid with that instrument. But you want to run right along there. And why? Because that's where the canal is. In order to open up the roof, what we call unroofing the, the canal, you have to skate along 50 micrometers above sclera. And then, once you've unroofed it, you don't want to go too far because then you'll be in the anterior chamber. And if you're in the anterior chamber, well, now it's a penetrating procedure. Once you've unroofed the canal, then you need to dissect the corneal uh, tissue off of decimase. So now, once again, you're taking a sharp instrument and you're carefully dissecting tissue off of what's essentially you know, a couple of micrometer thick tissue. So it's a lot like, um, I mean, the closest thing that I can compare it to is those old barber videos where to train the barbers, they take out a, a, a real blade, not the safety blades, put foam on a balloon and say, OK, you know, shave this balloon without breaking it. That's what, that's what canaloplasty is like for a surgeon who's, who's not yet gotten up the learning curve. I mean, now when I do it, I enjoy canaloplasty. I think it's a, it's, there's a lot of finesse to it. It's wonderful anatomy. There are few things that are comparable to opening up that window, seeing decimase, you know, completely intact, and seeing the fluid slowly percolate through it. It's just really neat. You see that, you say, well, of course this works. And you can see the fluid carefully coming through, unlike with trabeculectomy where, you know, you've got it gushing through and then you tie it too, high, too tight, nothing comes through, and you're find, trying to find that, that nice balance. The body gives you the right balance. It just percolates through that membrane. And, and then the actual uh, catheterization, that part is just like the ab internal. So the difference really is that with ab external canaloplasty, it's all in the approach. The approach takes a while, um, and it's, it's, frankly, it's just it's scary when you've not done it. The first time I saw Dr. Stegman's video, which was a, uh, a year or so before I started performing canaloplasty myself, I took a look at that video, and I just thought, damn, that is so cool. That surgeon is just, I'll never be doing that. I mean, I just, I never thought that I would, would do that um, because it just looked too difficult. And this is why canaloplasty has not, has not taken off. Um, once you've done, you know, a couple of dozen canaloplasties, you see that the anatomy is a little challenging, but the neat thing about it is that unlike trabeculectomy and tubes, it's almost a no harm, no foul surgery. There's almost nothing that you're going to do during canaloplasty that's going to make the eye worse off than it was before surgery, right? The, the, the risk profile is just so far in the advantage to patients versus the risk. And then once you see that, then surgeons become more comfortable with offering it. But even so, even the surgeons that are really skilled and real, that accept the value of canaloplasty for their patients, Many of them are, are just, they're just too busy or their surgery centers won't give them the time to perform the delicate dissection. Canaloplasty is not a surgery that can be rushed. It's a delicate dissection. There's no way around it. What ab interno canaloplasty does gets rid of all of that. Okay? You've taken a delicate dissection that takes a, a long time to do and you've switched it out with a paracentesis that <laughs> takes less than a second, right? So that's the incision. And then you place the catheter. And uh, all of the, the skills required for ab interno canalplasty are already skills that any doctor out there who does an eye stent has. Being able to work with a gonio prism, um, working in the angle. So if they've got those skills, they can do this. So, so this is why I'm, I'm most excited about this, because I think that this is, the canaloplasty is, is a surgery that I've wished for a long time, that there were more surgeons in the area doing it. I mean, it's, I, I've never been a very good businessman, so trying to create competition for me seems counterintuitive. But, uh, you know, ultimately, it's about our patients, right? And we want our patients 
to get the best treatment for them at the lowest risk that's going to provide them the most effect. And so if canaloplasty ab interno picks up, uh, I'm going to be very happy for all of the patients that have that rather than trabeculectomy or tube or eye stent, whether it's, you know, done by me or, or somebody else in the area. So anyway, uh, oh, you had another question? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What? How many years out do you think it's going to be approved? Oh, it's, ab interno is available right now. It's FDA approved because it's canaloplasty is approved. It's just a different approach. So the procedure itself, the code, everything's, it's all approved. It's just a different approach to the same surgery. Yeah. It, uh, what are the risks of perforation of the trabecular meshwork? And I guess at worst, you just got to... Right. So, so the, uh, the question was, in terms of uh, the ab externo, uh, or the internal, okay. So, so let me uh, briefly, uh, to give to give you a comparison here, with the ab external approach of canaloplasty, the worry has, has traditionally been, well, as you dissect down near, trabec near the uh, decimase, if you perforate, uh, what happens? Well, originally they said, oh, well, now you have to convert to trabeculectomy, which I never did, because the patients who came to see me came to see me specifically because they didn't want a trabeculectomy. So if we went into surgery, expecting canaloplasty, and I came out saying, oh, by the way, <laughs> you had a trabeculectomy. Well, they weren't going to be too happy. Um, so we've learned, those of us who do a fair amount of canaloplasty, that you don't have to convert. Even if you do perforate decimase, uh, the worst thing that happens generally is that maybe you have to make a PI. You might get a little too much flow early on, a little more hyphema. Uh, but, but eventually, the body heals down and you just have the, the flow that you would have had otherwise. With the ab interno approach, uh, there, there's really no risk of, of perforation. What you're doing is you're creating a small opening in through the trabecular meshwork into the canal. And if you make that a bit bigger than it has to be, oh well, it's a little bit bigger than it has to be, and you've, you've got just a little bit more of an opening there. Uh, but it's, it's really not something that you would consider to be uh, a risk or a complication. In fact, we're now learning that for those patients who've had canaloplasty with stent placement, so the proline suture, if down the line it stops working, um, and that's the other thing to, to be aware of is all glaucoma surgeries eventually fail. It's just a matter of time, right? So they all have these what we call mortality curves, right? We talked about trabeculectomy. It has a mortality curve that is pretty much at a 45 degree angle. Right? It's like 10% per year, right? Uh, glaucoma drainage devices are at about 5% per year. Canaloplasty alone is in the probably 5 to 7% per year. Canaloplasty with cataract surgery is more in the three to five percent per year. So really, that seems to just be the, the sweet spot in terms of uh, you know ensuring against future failure is to combine it with cataract surgery. Um, so we need to keep that in mind with with all of these surgeries. Is that you know if our patients live long enough. They may be looking at another surgery, which is another reason why I like canaloplasty, because it doesn't close doors, whether you use the internal approach or the external approach. We used to think that with external approach, well, you're creating a conjunctival flap. Oh, no, can't do trabeculectomy. Well, there was a study that looked at that. And the people who had canaloplasty, then trabeculectomy, did just as well as people that hadn't had canaloplasty. The trabeculectomies all worked equally poorly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with ab interno, though, even those people who say, oh, no, you know, you don't want to touch the conjunctiva, okay, fine. We'll go from the internal approach. But what I was getting at was that in those patients who have a stent and their canaloplasty eventually stops working, you can actually go in through a very simple procedure uh, with uh, either the... Um, micro forceps or, or even just a bent needle cystotome, go into the anterior seg anter segment of the eye, grab the suture, and pull. 
And what that does is it creates a trabeculotomy. So it's, uh, it's called the MIST procedure, minimally invasive suture trabeculotomy. And it opens it up. So you've now just done trabeculotome without a $50,000 unit. So everybody who has canaloplasty with stent placement, if they need to in the future, can have that stent removed. And a fair amount of them will get additional pressure lowering because you've now opened up the space between that uh, trabecular meshwork. So it's a, it's a neat surgery on so many levels. Um, but but that's, that is a key level, is that when you're dealing with glaucoma, you always, in the back of your mind, have to ask yourself the question, what next? Is this going to close doors on what may happen next? Glaucoma is a progressive disease. We cannot currently halt the progression. All we can do is slow it down. And why is that? Because everyone in this room, you know, whether we've got glaucoma or not, has a baseline loss of nerve fiber layer. And in the patients that have severe glaucoma, they've already lost so much that even that baseline is enough to result in loss of vision. A very simple analogy that I find works with my patients is tire tread. Okay? You, know, you could drive your car as slowly as you want with absolutely no you know, crazy turns and braking, but eventually you're going to wear down that tread. And once that tread is worn down, every remaining you know, bit, you know, atom of rubber that disappears is going to reduce your ability to drive safely. Well, with glaucoma, you've already lost a lot of tread. And so no matter how safely you drive at that point, right, you're still going to lose it too fast for the number of miles that you need to travel. And so that's what we need to keep in mind with, with glaucoma. And that also brings up one other point that one of my uh, attendings uh, was uh, you know, very savvy in making, is that you know, he had patients with glaucoma who were progressing, who were in their 90s, and their pressures were too high, and he would not recommend trabeculectomy, right? which at the time was really the only thing that was available for them. And the reason was, he said, the lifestyle um, changes and what I'm going to do to this patient in her 90s with trabeculectomy is not going to make up for the study but guaranteed loss of vision right, in her remaining years. And so it's very important to, to consider that. We don't have to consider that as much now that we have these lower risk, more effective therapies. Because no matter what somebody's age, okay, as long as someone can lie down flat on the, on the uh, surgery gurney for 10 minutes, right, ab inter internal canaloplasty is something that that person can benefit from. So we no longer have to take into consideration you know, someone's age, whether or not they're going to be able to take good care of themselves, because lid hygiene is important. You got bad blepharitis and you've got a bleb, you're setting yourself up for an inflected, infected bleb. Right? Uh, if you've got somebody with Parkinson's or some other kind of dementia who may not really be paying attention to, to what's going on, doing a lot of eye rubbing, you don't want to have a trabeculectomy. Um, you know, experienced glaucoma surgeons you know, all have one horror story at least of patients who did, did not have the mental status that uh, they needed to and noticed that they had this jellyfish in their eye and pulled it out. <laughs> you know, so, so blebs are, although they're very, very common, and trabeculectomy is still the most commonly performed surgery out there. It's, it's one that we really do now that we have options. We need to pause and ask the question, is this the most appropriate treatment for this patient who's sitting in front of me right now? Rather than reflexively go straight to trabeculectomy whenever someone reaches the limits of their drops and is still progressing, which is traditionally what's done and I'm sorry to say 
uh, seen a lot of consults from you know all over. Um, the reason why most people come to see me is because they've been told they needed a trap, they weren't given any other options, and thank God for the internet, they did some research and found out, wow, there are other options, they're just not that common. My hope is that the FDA approved option of ab internal canaloplasty will become more common because there's almost nobody who has glaucoma who couldn't benefit from this. Other, I know we're, um, I think I've actually met the CE requirements tonight. Uh, <laughs> any, any other questions? Are we, we good to go? All right, so I think we've got all the CE certificates up front. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.